sorry. Mexico and the U.S. have a very complicated relationship. Um, they have a very complicated history, and there are issues that concern both countries, a lot of issues, and one of these great issues, perhaps the largest one, is migration, immigration to the U.S. Um, so this is a picture of my friend Sergio. Uh, I met Sergio while I was a student in college in New York. I met him at this uh, worker center where I sometimes volunteered. And Sergio is from Mexico, from uh, Guerrero, but uh, he's also a Mixtec, an indigenous Mixteco. Uh, his first language is his Mixtec dialect. And this really struck me when I met him and some of his cousins and uh, another of, of his friends. And here they were in this city, you know, thousands and thousands of miles away in a different country. And this just made a deep impression in me. Uh, so I decided to make a project about it for my senior thesis in college. And so one of the first things I did was go to the library and look up Mixtec artwork. And I was delighted when I found these images. Um, these are ancient Mixtec codex from the 14th century. Now, I was born and I grew up here in, uh, in Mexico. I grew up here in San Miguel. Uh, and so I was familiar with pre-Columbian art, but for some reason when I saw these images and books at the library, something about it just clicked. And I decided I was gonna make a uh, modern day codex about Sergio's story. Uh, so this is an image from that. Uh, these are like some of the jobs that Mexican guys have in, uh, in New York. Just, you know, the grill man at the supermarket, the dishwasher, the delivery guy. There's an estimated 11.2 uh, undocumented immigrants in the U.S. Uh, most of them come from Mexico and Central America. Uh, there's a large immigrant population of uh, Mexicans in New York, and it's one of the fastest growing ones. It wasn't always so. And a lot of these guys, a lot of these people are uh, mixtecos, like Sergio. Uh, people leave their, you know, their cities, their villages, their home countries uh, because they lack opportunities at home. So in the case of Sergio, his father uh, died when he was very young and he had to provide for his family. He had to be the man of the house. Um, so when he was about 18, he came to the U.S. He tried uh, sneaking in and the first time he did, he was caught by the border patrol and beaten up. Um, now, my experience is very different than Sergio's experience. I have a dual citizenship. My father's American and my mother is Mexican, therefore I have two passports and I can enter and leave the U.S. as I please. Um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of kids that I grew up here in San Miguel obviously don't have that privilege. And so while I left as a teenager to go to high school and to college, uh, they left uh, my neighborhood here in La Colonia San Antonio to go uh, bus tables or shingle roofs and places like Dallas and other places in Texas. Um, so for the last years, I've been making children's books. Um, and so these images that I'm gonna show are from my latest book. It's gonna be published next year and it's called Pancho Rabbit and the Coyote. Now it's a story for children. It's a fable, but it has something else going on. Coyote is slang. Uh, for a person that smuggles people between the U.S. and Mexico border. Uh, there's an estimated 150,000 people that enter the U.S. without documents each year. Uh, that number was triple that in the early 2000s before the economic recession. And a lot of these people, uh, well, first, in case you're wondering, most of these statistics that I'm giving come from the Pew Research Center, Research Center which is a very uh, well-regarded um, source, a lot of major newspapers quote it often. Um, and so like I said, a lot of these people come from Mexico, but a lot of them also come from Central America. And in order to cross Mexico, many of them travel on top of trains uh, around 5,000 miles. Uh, this is incredibly dangerous. Uh, a lot of people don't make it. Uh, according to the Comisión Nacional de Derechos Humanos, the um, National Commission of Human Rights, the Mexican National Commission of Human Rights, around 350 and 500 migrants die each year while trying to reach the U.S. Now that number is probably a lot higher because a lot of these deaths are never uh, reported or a lot of these people, um, you know, are never found. 
Um, so this image is just of someone crossing the Rio Bravo, and obviously some people die drowning. Um, one of the biggest issues is just the violence that uh, migrants experience. There are, um, you know, there are gangs that take advantage of them. Organized crime and the cartels have their teeth uh, deep into it. It's a very profitable business because uh, migrants pay coyotes very exorbitant fees to reach their destinations, and many times they don't reach it. Reach it. There's also abuse from corrupt authorities, from vigilante groups. And one of the largest um, causes of death is actually dehydration while trying to cross the desert. Uh, one of my neighbors, that I, uh, he was a little older than me, but I used to play with him all the time. He didn't make it, and that's what happened to him. Um, now, it's not young men that make this, um, that go on this journey. It's also a lot of women. So a lot of women are victims to rape and other sexual abuse, and a lot of children. There's an estimated 1.2 million children, undocumented children, in the U.S., and many have gone through this journey. Um, so immigration is this very complicated issue. Obviously, the home countries, uh, you know, countries like Mexico, countries in Central America and the Caribbean that have large migrant populations need to improve the conditions at home so people are not forced to leave. But on the other side, on the flip side, the U.S. also has to, um, you know, make changes to its policies. It's very clear that uh, undocumented immigrants are taken advantage of. They're some of the hardest working people. A survey in 2005 by the Pew Research Center so that showed that 94% of uh, undocumented male immigrants were working while only 83% of their U.S. counterparts were. And they were often working in uh, very grueling jobs like farm work and uh, construction. Um, they get paid less. Uh, they don't have many, often they don't have things like uh, health insurance or any benefits. And to top it off, they often get a bad rep in the media. Uh, immigrants are usually associated with terrorists or with uh, drug traffickers. Um, I think some people do have sympathy and realize how hardworking uh, these people are. But one thing that I want to point out and that I think um, many people don't realize is just kind of the separation and the longing that exists uh, among families. There are, you know, children here in San Miguel and the rural communities, los ranchos around here, and, uh, and all over Mexico that grow up without a father. And there are guys in places like, uh, you know, Texas, California, New York, North Carolina, all over the place that have not seen their children in five or ten years uh, because they're too worried that if they come back, they won't be able to go back to the U.S. Um, you know, I started this talk with a saying, uh, a Mexican saying, which is so far from God, so close to the United States. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of truth to that, but that's not where I want to end this talk. And so I want to talk briefly of why I decided to make children's books in the first place. Uh, when I was a student in New York, for a while I lived in this neighborhood called Sunset Park in Brooklyn. And there's a large uh, Mexican community there. And when I first moved there, it was winter. And the thing that impressed me the most were the children. Because the kids, you know, they had big poofy jackets. And they had their boots. And there was snow on the ground. And they all per, uh, spoke perfect English. Um, but their faces were just the same faces of the kids that I grew up here in San Miguel. It was the faces of the same kids that I went to school with, that I played soccer with. So I decided to make this book called Dear Primo, which is about two cousins, one that lives in a rural community in Mexico and one that lives in an urban center in the U.S. And although their environments are very different, um, at the core, they're very alike. And this, I, and this is just sort of what I observed, you know. Children care about um, school, about their family, about uh, hanging out with their friends. And through living in both countries and through making artwork and through uh, interacting with children, that's what I've come to realize too, that you know, regardless of the environment and the politics that exist between you know, US and Mexico, um, at the end of the day, you know, children are children, people are people, and we are more alike than different. Gracias.